Um, so it was the, the first award uh, winning for this first day of NetExplo Forum, and now it's time to see other uh, uh, tech innovations that were screened by NetExplo team, and it concerns, of course, what we've just seen. It's health, the top 10 of health innovation. Right, still talking about health, augmented health thanks to data and artificial intelligence. The next winner is uh, the founder of uh, Lauren D. Here is a video. This personal assistance AI analyzes your symptoms and gives you a diagnostic. It can also take you to the medical professional you need close to where you stand. Day after day, Your.md knows you even better. With Your.md, you're in control of your health. Your.md, the doctor in your pocket. To better understand what Your.md does, uh, it's a real representation of uh, this new health technology. Patrick Ferrari is uh, coming with us. He's the head of Capgemini Consulting. Good morning, Patrick. Uh, you know what you've got to do. Now it's your turn to tell us in one minute why you think that uh, this is a great innovation. Good morning and thank you very much. I would like to thank NetExpo. We are delighted to be part of the NetExpo Forum, especially for its 10th anniversary. Capgemini is celebrating its 50th anniversary, so we had really to do something to celebrate that anniversary. Three uh, things to remember about this project. First, health how the digital technology is going to make our lives and health better. Two, machine learning. Julien Levy mentioned it earlier. When you're now going to see that machine learning can apply to medical science. And three, you, we, we and empowerment, uh, how we can be empowered thanks to digital technologies. Three points, uh, uh, for three reasons for which you should support this project. Thank you very much. You can take a seat. Um, we are going to, we are going to see. Exactly, if you need to see an actual doctor in real life, please welcome from the UK, Matteo Bellucci, co-founder of Your.md, and our NetExplo expert, Dr. Steve Moyle from Oxford University. Hello, Patrick. Mettez-vous là-bas. Um, Dr. Moyle, ha have a seat. Well, you all have seats and we'll, we'll sort it out. Um, Matteo, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, by the way, I know we have a video, sort of a little video demo of the app that we can run while we chat so people get a better idea. Uh, although the app is already available, anyone here can download it. Yeah, absolutely. The app is available on uh, the app stores for Google and uh, iPhone. And we're also on uh, several messengers like Skype, uh, Slack, Telegram and so on. Because the, 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 the core of the engine is like a, a, a conversational bot. You just ask questions, it gives you answers. 
Well, yes, it has to be, because when you go to the doctor, you have to tell them what's wrong with you, and the doctor asks you lots of questions. And that's why you have to have a natural language layer so that you can get all those strange things that are going on you know, in your head and with your health that it would be impossible to do with a, with a map of the body, for example. I tried it out. It's funny to ask it very fuzzy questions like, I have a headache. Um, the, what problem exactly does your .nd solve? So the problem is a, is a global problem. There is a global health crisis. By 2050, most uh, developed economies will not be able to afford healthcare anymore if it goes on like this. So we looked at what are the biggest things that you could do to impact how healthcare is delivered today. And we realized that one of the biggest problems is just giving people the right information. Fundamentally, healthcare is an information problem. Because most people that go to the doctor, and in the UK, according to the NHS, 90% of the visits to a doctor are for minor conditions, which could be treated on your own. It's fundamentally knowing what you need to know. So you go to the doctor to be told what to do. So one of the, the, director, the deputy director general this morning was saying, you know, the key principles of UNESCO, one is freedom of information and access to information. Why shouldn't we have access to health information? to be able to decide what to do with our own health. So the idea with your MD is trying to give people the information they need. But what is the problem? The problem is that everybody's different. We're all different. We have different situations, different histories, different symptoms. We live in different places. There are different illnesses. And so Google cannot do that. Google is not designed for personalized health information because Google uses the most generic information, the most popular. You use the example of headache. If we all type headache in Google, we get the same results. Yeah, which is so usually it'll, it'll get, tell you you have a cancer. terminal disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but we could have you know four different illnesses. So the problem that we're trying to solve is specifically to give people the best information because we think this is the biggest thing you can do to change healthcare. Um, are there any other ways you can think of to do this? Why is this the best way to deliver that kind of advice? Because the only way you can do it today is going to the doctor. The doctor is the repository of this information. So if we had an infinite number of doctors, or if we, if we all had a doctor in our family, that you wouldn't need your MD. But the problem is that the global health crisis is specifically this gap between demand and supply. Population is growing, we're getting older, we are getting you know, used to having a lot of, uh, you know, we have lifestyles that unfortunately give us obesity and diabetes and other things. And the number of doctors is actually shrinking. In the UK, there was an article last week on The Guardian that said that two in five doctors are thinking of quitting their job. So how do you do this? You know, how, I don't think there's any other way than using artificial intelligence. You need free, scalable, accessible, personalized information. Um, what exactly is the role of artificial intelligence in, in that system? The role of artificial intelligence is, is in various parts of the system, but fundamentally it's trying to mimic the thought process of a doctor. So what we've done is we decompose the thought process of the doctor from the initial interaction, you're saying the questions, you know, what should I ask? If you have headache, what's the next question? And then understanding all the medical complexity that are you know, hidden under, you know, conditions, personal profiles. And it's a huge data problem. And quoting, I saw some beautiful slides about Galileo and, uh, and, and other famous scientists. There's, you know, one other one is Pierre-Simon Laplace, Frenchman, who studied probability and he basically said probability is, is the science of transforming gut feel into numbers. When we go to the doctor today, the doctor uses gut feel. Now, why couldn't quant we quantify that and turn it into a number so that I have the exact probability of having angina or heartburn or a heart attack? And that's where the AI comes in. It's really unraveling this extremely complex problem and turning into uh, processable numbers. Actually, at what point does the app or the bot decide that, okay, now you need to see an actual doctor? So it does it in two ways. One, there is a safety net because, for example, if you have vomiting blood, it doesn't matter what's wrong with you. You need to go to hospital. So it, it's, a, mm -hmm. you know. But then there are other conditions where the bot is building up confidence on what might be the problem. And if the problem, we basically put the problems into three types. You can self-care, 
you may need to see a doctor in the next few days or you need an, it's an emergency. So the bot is aware of this and based on what condition comes up at the top and on the level of confidence, then the system will recommend the next steps. What's the business model behind that? Because that, the, the advice on my app is free. It is indeed, as is Google. So the business model is actually something that we came up later on after we launched the system. We realized just, that just if, like Google, actually, like, just yeah. like Google, we realized that if we could give to each of you the best health information that you need, then we'll also be in a great place to recommend services, products, apps, and partners that could help you should you need any help with that situation. So. If you end up being the hub for information, you're generally also in a great position to be the best marketing platform for the ecosystem. So our plan, and we already started, is to connect you also with a service provider that has been vetted that can help you with that specific problem. And these partners pay us per click, like Google. You, you understand that, of course, personal health data is amongst the most personal data that we have, apart from maybe, I don't know, pictures of my kids. Um, how, how do you, what's your promise to the users as to how you're going to handle that, that data? So our promise is very clear. The data is owned by the user, is your data, okay? And actually, if you look at the app today, we don't even ask for personal identifiable information. Yeah, you don't have to open an account. You, you don't just, have to open an account yeah. because we just need to know your gender and your year of birth. We don't even need to know the date of birth. So we actually asked for the email, but it's an optional thing, and it's just for marketing purposes. But our future plan is to make sure that your data is um, locked into the system with your own password so that nobody else can see it apart from you. We just need the aggregate data. We don't need individual data. It's no use to us. I remember over 10 years ago, a system that was sort of similar, uh, coming from the NHS in the UK, where you would go on the website to see, you know, do I need to go to the, um, to the emergency room? And it would sort of parse your symptoms and say pretty much what you said, like ne yes, no, or how about you call your family doctor in the morning? Um, do you get any interest from, from, you know, public health? So before I answer that, that system has been decommissioned by the NHS because it was not working. It actually created more people visiting the doctor and, and emergency. Yeah, but now they can put it at, on an iPad at the entrance of the ER, like, no, all right. But, but the technology wasn't working because it was based on a logical tree. It was very mm -hmm. simple. If you have this, then you go down the tree and it would just break all the time. So yes, we have a lot of inquiries and we're starting working with, uh, with pharma, with insurance companies, because what we can do is put a number next to your individual profile for the likelihood of suffering from any condition. So we are going to launch this month uh, on a site of one of the biggest pharma companies in the world, a tool to enable users to assess themselves for problems with their thyroid gland. Oh. And we use these very complex probability models to just let you know, you know if you are likely or not to suffer from that condition. That's interesting. Uh, can we run the video so we can see a few, um, a bit of a demo of, the, of your system? Um, last question, how much of, a, of an impact do you anticipate you could make? Well, the impact that this technology can have, whether we succeed or somebody else, I think this is inevitable. I, I believe that in a few years' time, we will use technology to assist us in self-care. Self-care is the only way to change the economics of healthcare. There's no other way. Today is all centralized. It needs to be outsourced to the patients. But patients need help. They need some technology to guide them in self-care. So I think that this technology can have a huge impact both in developed and developing economies. In developed economies because there's a shortage of doctors and there are all the problems with the costs associated with it. In emerging markets, there are 2.5 billion people that have no direct access to a medical professional. So they must have a replacement. And this technology is the replacement, is to give accurate, personalized, trustworthy information to anyone who needs it at any time of the day, 24-7. So I think the impact for this is going to be enormous, and we hope to be the ones that end up being one of the famous logos on your slides from the previous years. <laughs> but it's very challenging, and I think we have one of the best approaches, and we definitely have the most advanced AI on this, as it's been tested by Oxford University in February and by the NHS, and they gave us really, really high scores. So very exciting times. 
Thank you, Matteo. Let's, let's now chat with our expert to see why and how this is actually a breakthrough. Um, Dr. Moll, oh, of, sure, of course. Um, Dr. Moll, can we actually have an idea of how much data you have to feed into the system to make it, you know, smart enough to make a decision not just based on a decision tree, like uh, you have a headache, which side of the head, etc. Well, I don't know the insides of your system. Maybe, <laughs> uh, Matteo, you might be able to tell us how much data you need. No, I can tell you very quickly. It depends on which part of the problem you're trying to break. So the input part, you need a lot of data to understand what people are saying, because everybody expresses themselves in different ways. That's where you have the deep learning models to understand really what people are saying. On the decision model, we use a different approach. We use a different type of artificial intelligence. It's called causation artificial intelligence. We need the cause and effect. If you have pneumonia, you're probably going to have a high temperature. We know that. We don't need to learn that. Okay? You, you so don't just correlate a list of symptoms. We, need, we have that knowledge already. You don't need to learn it with machine learning. Machine learning is called machine learning because you're learning something. But we already know what conditions, you know, a virus has certain effects. So we're coding that into the system and we use a type of logical Bayesian logic, which is a very complex thing that humans are really bad at <laughs> and computers are very good at. So the data is used mo in various parts of the system. We have a lot of data, but you've got to be really careful of something that Julian Levy said this morning. You cannot let the bots learn by themselves when it comes to medicine. You can let them learn how to recognize pictures. But if you go into what we do, which is making decisions on what condition you could have, you cannot do it with unassisted machine learning because it's very, very dangerous. The best example is that computers will very quickly decide that being religious is correlated to having cancer. So you cannot do that, trust me. <laughs> Uh, all decision models make errors, and the costs of making errors are asymmetric, uh, depending on the context. So what I like about their design is you know, health and uh, causation information has been developed over decades, or if not hundreds of years. So why not codify that in the appropriate causal models? There's other places that they've used what we would call AI, and that's at the front end, trying to understand the natural language dialogue between the remote patient and, uh, and the bot. And mm. you can afford to make a few more errors on trying to understand what people are saying because it's not at that critical diagnostic causation level. That's actually, absolutely correct. Actually, it works in English, but not just in English. So it's a very good question. It is in English, but what we realized when we were building this is that we had to do it at an abstract level because headache it's a concept. You call it mal de tête, mal de testa, pain in the head. It doesn't matter what you call it, but it's a clear concept. So you can create a code for that concept. And then it doesn't matter what label you attach to the code. So you can put French, uh -huh. Norwegian, Italian, whatever you want. So we, the, all the AI operates at a concept level. So it's very easy for us to translate, and we plan to start translating it this year. Um, Dr. Moyle, what, you know, technologically makes this possible today that would not have been available 5, 10, 20 years ago? Uh, I, I think the, the, the science is relatively um, established. It's the delivery mechanisms, really. So getting it onto your, mm -hmm. your smartphone. Actually, I used it on Slack through the web. It's that ubiquity of communications that the Internet has given us that allows that remote uh, interaction to occur. It's also the computing power, mm -hmm. because you need to crunch a lot of data, and it was really, really expensive. It still is very expensive. So, but you know, today you can do it even if you're a startup, and so that's what it enabled it. And it's also maybe easier to scale now faster than you would have done 10 years ago. Um, I'll ask this to both of you. Is trust an issue when you are used to getting a diagnosis in the context of an interaction with a human being. I mean, you know, just the way that when people think about robots, they will tell you, okay, industrial robots, good idea. Personal service robots, sure, why not? Hairdresser robot, forget it. Um, you don't want a robot, yeah, yeah I don't know, you don't, you don't have the problem. I could use one. Yes. But so is, is trust an issue? Will you treat the advice and, and diagnosis that you get on your screen the same way you would treat the advice from a physician? 
Uh, I think trust is a very big issue, and not just for this particular technology, but all uh, mechanized technologies that we have. Um, someone wants to find trust as uh, something that can harm you. You put your trust in, in something that can, can harm you. And making a, a misdiagnosis is something that could potentially harm us. Um, it's interesting, it's a cultural phenomenon as to what people do and don't trust, and it's a generational phenomena as well. And we're seeing the younger generations who are prepared to release their personal information constantly without giving a concern to, to trust. Um, doctors and priests, the two most <laughs> trusted people, uh, roles on the planet, or have been in history, um, I wonder how long before we have your priest instead of your MD. I'm sure there's an app for you know, uh, absolution somewhere. But, but if there is a problem with trust, uh, we've seen that uh, IBM now have a, uh, an AI-based uh, lawyer robot. So we could find when there's a, uh, a medical litigation problem that the robots can uh, slug it out in the courts. Do you see any other area where that kind of impact can be achieved? Well, just in, in healthcare, there's more that can be done than just this uh, dialogue with a, with a, with a doctor. You know, this is all post-symptomatic type of medicine. If we uh, carry our Fitbits with us, we will have our systems pre-diagnosing us before we actually have uh, a, a symptom. And I think that's something really to, to look forward to. Um, Humans love to share and care. Um, where are all the other services that, that, that caring is provided uh, that could be done remotely? Uh, the, the, the last winners there with the uh, remote mm -hmm. uh, glove, you know, perhaps a, a massage might be nice. Um, that's, that's certainly shown to have very good mental health benefits. But uh, I'm sure that's who, potential who there. That? Yeah. Robot masseuse. Yeah. yeah, I can comment on this quickly. Yes, well-being is very important. So what we think at, at UMD, what we're trying to build is a personal health assistant, not a symptom checker. But you understand that many technology companies and startups will say, oh, we're in the well-being business. Yeah. We are not in the health business because it is a heavily regulated sure. profession and industry. Of course, but we are clearly a medical application. But in our view of the world, your personal health assistant should help you get better, but it should also help you keep well. So what we do is we have a very sophisticated push notification platform. We are developing the ability to send you regular updates on how to stop smoking, if that's what you want to do, or how to eat healthily. And that's not really well-being. That's more health-related. So we know very well that we don't want to step into fitness, and that, that's a very murky world for us. But closing the loop is important. It's okay uh, to go to the doctor, but if you don't do what the doctor says, you're not going to get better. And having some uh, monitoring and tracking can actually improve. Yeah, outcomes. but my, my doctor doesn't send me notifications on my smartphone. No, you, it doesn't. That's actually why technology is better, because technology can, can, look, can follow up. But closing the loop, uh, as Steve was saying, is actually a huge challenge. And it's a huge challenge because, unfortunately, even if you go to the doctor, how do you know the doctor is right? There are certain conditions that take years to diagnose. A friend of mine I saw the weekend has multiple sclerosis. It took him two and a half years to be diagnosed. So, and according to Harvard, they did a study that 70% of the time the doctors are right, but 30% of the times they're wrong. So if you use their feedback, you introduce a 30% error in your data, which should kill you. So I trust people more. So our view is to send notifications to users and say, a week later, two weeks later, how are you feeling? Did you work out what it was? Yes, no? And so we could do it that way. And, but closing the loop is very important indeed. How long before the, the app or the bot can send me a prescription? That's my dream. Um, <laughs> well, we need to pass the medical exam because we need to become a doctor. And I actually have, we have an internal goal to get to that point in the next couple of years. We want to take this to the authority in England that certifies doctors, which is the Royal College of General Practitioners, and put the, the machine through the exam. And then if we pass, then we should be allowed to prescribe medicines automatically without the intervention of a human being, which would be phenomenal. All right. Matteo, Steve, Patrick, come with me. Let's have a, a picture of my, my personal Instagram and maybe an award.
right. That is it. So we are excited to share this uh, superb trophy with you. Congratulations and all the best for your future. All right. Give him a smile. All right, thank you. Thank Congratulations. You. Je vous en prie. Um, why was I going to do this in English? On va faire une pause déjeuner. Nous reviendrons ici à 13. Okay, let's take a short break now. We'll be back at 10 past 1. It's a short lunch break by French standards. Uh, but uh, we have uh, an important news bulletin from China first. Well, the Chinese artificial intelligence engineer decided to build his future wife himself. He dated Ying Wing, a 30 kilogram robot, for two years before they married. Jian decided to upgrade his wife soon, as Ying Wing can only read few characters and say simple words. We wish them every happiness.